the Continental Statesman. In the task of constructing a new international order, which Napoleon's defeat in Russia so unexpectedly thrust on Europe, the problem of Austria took an almost symbolic quality for the geographic and historical reasons situated in the century of Europe amidst potentially hostile powers with no natural frontiers and a polygot composition of German, Slavs, and Italians. Austria was the semi-monograph of Europe. It was certain to be the first victim of any major upheaval because war could only increase the central feudal element of a state whose sole bond of union was the common crown. And because Austria's need for stability was so great, and because law is the expression of the status quo, Austria stood for the sense of limit and importance of the equilibrium for the necessity of law and the sanctity of treaties. Austria, said Talleyrand, is the chamber of peers of Europe. But even more than its geographic location, its domestic structure symbolized the dilemmas of Europe. Until the end of the 18th century, the Austrian Empire had been among the most vigorous of the European states. As late as 1795, the Prussian patriot Stein could still favorably compare the conesiveness and prosperity of the Austrian monarchy with that of Prussia. But now, with the Russian army sweeping westward, came the first rumblings that were to transform the Austrian Empire into the prisons of nation. Not the system of government grew more oppressive, only that its legitimacy came increasingly to be questioned, for a prison is not only physical, but also a psychological state. It had been occurred to no one in the 18th century that the Habsburg Emperor was a foreigner, merely because he represented a German dynasty. Because in the 19th century, this was emerging as a truism, and because the offensive makes adaption difficult, Austria's policy was destined to become increasingly inflexible. The Austrian Empire had not changed, but history was beginning to pass it by. The tattered remnants of the Grand Army, which appeared in Central Europe in the winter of 1812, therefore represented to Austria an augury of both success and, and of danger. Of success, for with the collapse of Napoleon's army, Austria, for the first time in three years, will be able to conduct a truly independent policy, a policy not limited by the consciousness that survival depended on the will of one man, and of danger, for it will still not clear what will emerge out of the chaos of the disintegrating French power. The new doctrines of nationalism and rationalized administration could not but be dissolving for so intricate and so subtle a structure as this last survivor of the feudal period, nor it was certain whether the pressure from the West was about to be replaced by a similar threat from the East, how to avoid both impotence and dissolution, how to achieve both peace and proportion, both victory and legitimacy. When the faith of empires at stake, the convictions of their statesmen are the medium for the survival, and success depends on the correspondence of these convictions with the special requirements of the state. It was Austria's destiny that in the years of crisis it was guided by a man who epitomized, by, epitomized its very essence. It was its destiny and not good fortune for as the Greek tragedy. The success of Clement von Metternich made inevitable the ultimate collapse of the state he had fought so long to preserve. Like the state he represented, Metternich was a product of an age in the process of being transcendent. He was born in the 18th century, of which Talleyrand was to say that nobody who lived after the French Revolution would ever know how sweet and gentle life could be. And the certainty of the time of his youth never left Metternich. Contemporaries might sear at his invocation of maxims of the sound reason as his facile philosophizing and polished epigrams, they did not understand that it was an accident of history which projected Metternich into a revolutionary struggle so foreign to his temperament, for like the century that formed him, his style was adapted better to the manipulation of factors 
treated as given in the contest of will, better their, to achievement through a proportion, through scale. He was a Rocco figure, complex, finely carved, and surface, all surface like an intricately cut prism. His face was delicate, without depth, his conversation brilliant, without the ultimate seriousness. Equally at home in the salon and in the cabinet, graceful and facile, he was a built ideal of the 18th century aristocracy which justify itself, not by its truth, but by its existence. And if never came to terms with the new age, it was not because he failed to understand its seriousness because he disdained it. Therein too his faith was the faith of Austria. It was this man who for over a generation who ruled Austria and often Europe with the same methods and almost a nonchalant manipulation he had learned in youth. But no amount of deviousness could be a scur the fact that he engaged in a revolutionary contest and this imparted an unintended tenseness to Menelik's most subtle maneuvers. He might achieve victory, but not comprehension, and for this reason he came to use the proudest claims of the Enlightenment, the belief in universality of maxims of reasons and increasingly self-consciousness as a weapon in the revolutionary struggle. Had Metternich had been for, born 50 years earlier, he would still have been a conservative, but there would have been no need to write pedantic disquisitions about the nature of conservatism. He would have been moved through the drawing rooms of the fashionable world with undeniable charm and grace, subtly, aloofly, conducting his diplomacy with the with certain the confidence which is a symbol of certainty of a world in which everybody understands the intangibles in the same manner. He was still played at philosophy, for this was the vogue of the 18th century, but he would not consider its tool of policy, but in a century seemingly a permanent revolution. Philosophy was the only means of rescuing universality from contingent claims. It was for this reason that Metternich fought so insistently against the identification of his name with this period, an attitude seems seemingly so inconsistent with his vanity. If there was a Metternich system, his achievements would be personal, his battles meaningless. To individualize an idea, he insisted, leads to a dangerous conclusion as if the individual could cause a wrong conception for when it does apply, it indicates that cause does not exist. But disminulated. It's a dilemma of conservatism that it must fight revolution anonymously for what it is that but not what it says. So it came that it came about that Metternich in his never ending battle against the revolution went back to the doctrines of the age where he has been brought up, but interpreted them with an inflexibility which had been unnecessary which had been unnecessary when they were still taken for granted, which distorted their essence in application, he was still a generation of the whom of the great clockwork or the golden age was more than an idle dream. There was a thickness in the universe which corresponded to the man's numerous aspirations, a well-ordered mechanism, the understanding of which ensures success and whose laws cannot be violated with impunity. States, just as human beings, often the laws. The only difference is the severity of their penalty. Society has its laws, just as nature in a man. It is the old institution such as with old men they can never be young again. This is the way of the social order and cannot be different because it is the law of nature. The moral world has its storms, just like the material one. One cannot cover the world with ruins without crushing a man beneath them. Menenik used the truisms of the 18th century philosophy to oppose revolution and liberalism, not because they were wicked, but because they were unnatural, only because he did not wish to live in a world his opponents sent to create, but because the world was doomed to failure. A revolution was an assertion of will and of power, but the essence of existence was proportion. It expresses its a it's expressions was law.
and its mechanism and equilibrium. For this reasons, the conservative statesman was the supreme realist. His opponents, the visionaries. I am a man of prose, Menenik insisted in his political testament, and not of poetry. My point of departure is quiet contemplation, contemplation of the affairs of the world and not those of the others which I know nothing and which are the object of faith which is in the strict opposition to knowledge in the social world. One must act cold-bloodedly based on observation and without hatred or prejudice. I was born to make history, not to write novels. If I guess correctly, this is because I, I know. Invention is the enemy of history which knows only discoveries and only which exists can be discovered this was the myth of a philosopher king the ideal 18th century ruler who stood above the plain where personal feelings reigned cool composed superior statesmanship was a science of the interest of states and subject to laws anguished to the laws of the physical world the statesman was a philosopher who understood these maxims, who performed his task but reluctantly, but for they deflected him, the source of the only real enjoyment, a contemplation of truth. He was responsible only to his conscience and to history, to the former because it contained his vision of truth, to the latter because it proved, because it provided the only test of its validity. Reaction against Menelik's smug self-satisfaction and rigid conservatism has tended for over a century now to take form of denying the reality of his accomplishments. But a man who came to dominate every coalition in which he participated, who was considered by two foreign monarchs as more trustworthy than their own ministers, who for three years was in fact the prime minister of Europe, such a man could not be a mean consequence. To be sure, the success he liked to ascribe to the more superiority of his maxims was more often due to extraordinary skill of his diplomacy. His genius was instrumental, not creative. He excelled at manipulation, not construction, trained in the school of 18th century cabinet diplomacy. He preferred subtle maneuver to frontal attack. While his rationalism frequently made him mistake a relatively manifesto for an accomplished action, Napoleon said of him that he confused policy with intrigue. Hardenberg, the envoy of Hanover at Vienna, wrote the following analysis of Metternich to promote the methods at the height of the crisis of 1812. Endowed with high opinion of the superiority of his ability, he loved finesse in politics and considered it essential, since he does not have sufficient energy to mobilize the resources of his country. He attempts to substitute cunning for strength and character. It would suit him best if a fortunate accident, the death of Napoleon, or the great successes of Europe, of Russia, were create a situation where he could let Austria play an important role. Frederick von Gentz, a long Menerich's, for a long Menerich's closest associates, has probably the best capsule of description of Menerich's methods and personality. Not a man of strong passions and of cold measures, not a genius, but a great talent, cool, calm, and calculator par excellence. This was the statesman to whom Austria's faith was entrusted in 1812, doctrinaire, but in the universal manner of the 18th century, devious, because the very certainty of his conventions made him extremely flexible in his choice of means, matter of fact and aloof wholly pursuing the art of statescraft, his, character, his characteristic quality was tact, sensibility to nuance. Such a man might have dominated the 18th century, but he was formidable in any age, a mediocre strategist, but a great tactician. He was a master of the set battle and periods when frameworks was given, or the objectives imposed from the outside. Such a period was the year 1812, and the issue for Menenik was not so much the liberation of Europe as the restoration of equilibrium, both moral and physical. Menenik, the most Austrian statesman, did not see Austria until his 13th year. It did not live there until his 17th. Born in the Rhineland, educated in Strasbourg and Mainz, raised in Brussels, where his father, 
was the governor general of the Low Countries. Manenek had the typical upbringing of the 18th century aristocrat, cosmopolitan and rationalist. He was always more at home in the French language than in German, but however typical, Menenik of the 18th century of aristocracy did not follow the riskful evaluation of the French Revolution. The wars of Napoleon did not seem to him like the wars of the 18th century, set battles with finite objectives which left the basic structure of obligation unaffected, nor did he believe it possible to satisfy the conqueror by compromise to the moderate him by concession or to obligate him by alliance. All nations had made their mistakes, he wrote in 1807, to attach a treaty with France, the value of peace while immediately preparing again for war. No peace is possible with a revolutionary system, whether Rosfer who declared war on Chattanooga or Napoleon who declares war on powers. And this belief was reinforced by his conviction that the principle of solidarity of states superseded that of revolution. Isolated states only exist abstractions of so-called philosophers. In the society of states, each state has interests and in which connect with the others. The great axioms of political science derive from the recognition of the true interest of all states. It is the general interest that guarantee the existence to be found while the particular interests the cultivation which is considered the political wisdom by the restless and short-sighted men have only a secondary importance. Modern history demonstrates the application of the principles of solidarity and equilibrium in which a unit, united efforts of states against the supremacy of one power in order to force a return to the common law. What becomes of an egotistical policy, a policy of fantasy and of miserable gain? But in 1801, when Mennonite began his diplomatic career, the solidarity of states seems untangible. Nothing more difficult to harmonize in contestable principles and a system of conduct, adopting a direct opposition to them. There remain only the task of creating the balance of power, not to be sure in order to guarantee the universal peace, but to achieve a tolerable armistice. Benedict's first diplomatic reports when at the age of 28, he was appointed to the Austrian envoy in Saxony, reveal the conception of this equilibrium, which was a guide to his policy throughout his life, that the power of France must be reduced, and Austria and Prussia must forget their recent past. The wars fought for the possession of Silesia. Not competition, but cooperation was their natural policy. An equilibrium was possible only through a strong central Europe backed by England for the interest of a power exclusively commercial and a power entirely continental could never lead to a rivalry. But equilibrium based on the consideration of power is the most difficult of all established particularly in a revolutionary period following a long period lulled by the memory of stability. States tend to seek security and activity and to mistake impotence for the lack of provocation, the conqueror is to be tamed by reason and perhaps by collaboration, but policies in short cannot conceive the mortal threats or total destruction. Coalitions against revolutions have usually come about only at the end of a long series of betrayals and upheavals for the powers which represent legitimacy and the status quo cannot know that their antagonist is not amenable to reason until he has demonstrated it, and he will not demonstrate it until the international system is already overturned. Menenik was to the experience, this was when he was sent in 1804 to negotiate an alliance with Prussia. He found a court which he saw in the preparation for self-defense, the most certain provocation for war, and the cons in a concerted action that the seed of universal doom, almost alone among his contemporaries, Menenik understood the weakness of Prussia, still surrounded by the nimbus of Frederick the Great, but demoralized by a long period of peace. There exists, he wrote in a whimsical fashion, a conspiracy of mediocrities, united by a common terror of any decisive action. There is nobody to remain the king,
that his army might prepare to be utilized to a greater advantage on the field of battle than on the plains of Berlin and Potsdam. The Prussian monarchy was triple in size since the death of Frederick II and has declined in real strength. Frederick William III will certainly not use a language from the century of the vast dominions which was not foreign to Frederick II from the will walls of the capital which never ceased being an armed camp. The construction of equ the construction of an equilibrium therefore depended not merely of strength but on resolution to use it. If the fear of France was preventing a joint action, perhaps the fear of Russia could rein it. We shall count conquer Prussia only in Russia, Metternich said, and began a diplomatic campaign which brought Russian troops to the Prussian border with the ultimatum of an alliance or war, but the King of Prussia refused to accept a so patent infraction of normal relations of states and threatened to exist by the force of arms. War was averted only by the principle by the Prisipatic of Napoleon, who marched troops through the exception of Prussian territory, and thereby brought himself the wrath of Frederick William, an outrage probability which had never been able to earn as a conqueror bent on dominating Europe. Everything seemed one. A Prussian negotiator was sent to Vienna to make the final arrangements for a treaty of alliance. The Prussian army moved towards the Franks of the French forces invading Bohemia. Russian troops was traversing Poland, a decisive defeat for Napoleon seen in the making. But timid men are more likely to move in the trepidation than to the daring in the face of great opportunities. The, the traditions of a century, uninterrupted expansion, the rules of cabinet diplomacy according to which the maximum bargain had to be struck in the hour of the greatest need combined caused Prussia to delay its final commitment. It is the essence of mediocrity that it prefers the tangible advantage to the intelligible gain in position. Does Prussia choose this precise moment to haggle over a military frontier along Wester and advance a proposal on arm meditation on, re on reasonable terms to obtain one proof of Napoleon's Perfidy. In the vein did Metternich preach the lessons of the equilibrium of security based on the relations of states and not on territorial extent. In the vein he did inquire how a power could mediate on its behalf. This was not a problem of logic. While Prussia hesitated, the French army willed south and defeated the, the Austrians in Russia at Austerlitz. Again a point was reached where the theory of limited war settled peace while the reality of a revolutionary conflict indicated perseverance. Menenik's struggle was now was his own government. He insisted that Napoleon seeming uh, impotence was but the reflection of disunity of his opponents, that the combined allied armies still far outnumbers Napoleon's. He urged that the defeat to be frankly avowed, but that it served as a moral basis for a renewed effort, but if Prussia used the crisis to clinch her gains, Austria saw in it an opportunity to trim her losses and negotiated a separate peace. Meanwhile, Napoleon's army deployed against Prussia, yet not yet to destroy her, but to over but to intimidate her into becoming an accomplice by incorporating Hanover, and thus isolating herself from Great Britain and the Russian armies returned to Poland. 100,000 men had defeated five times their number, then they exclaimed, where's the manna? When will God appear from the wings? And he added that he was in the state of conditional despair, but that only death, which destroyed all hope, could make his decision unconditional. Little wonder that henceforth Metternich sought to delay the Austrian commitment until after that all its potential allies that he distrusted protections of loyalty based on the promises of future fulfillment that he constructed alliances only after a period of deliberation that seemed maddening to those eager for Austria's cooperation.
but which was essential to test the moral strength of the coalition. It is the nature of statesmen conducting a policy at petty advantage to seek vacillation a substitute for action. A policy which lets itself be influenced by events, which in the formal phase awaits development, is likely to seek the remedy against the decisions recognized as erroneous in adopting an extreme opposite without considering the possibility of intermediary solutions. So Prussia, whose hesitation had largely caused the disaster of 1806, suddenly awakened to the realization that despite the incorporation of Hanover, its relative position had been weakened and foolhardily plunged into war with France it had so desperately attempted to avoid during the previous year. But Napoleon was not def defeated in single combat. Prussia suffered at Jena and Osterdat, the faith of Austria at Aus Auschwitz. Once more, the promised Russian support proved illusory. After a Russian defeat at Friedland, Napoleon and Alexander met on a raft in the river Nia at Tilsit. There complete the division of the world. But the overthrow of the existing structure paradoxically seemed to reduce menacing confidence in an eventual triumph. For now, the inconsolability between Napoleon's material and moral base was apparent. The intermediary powers had been eliminated. The time of unlimited victories gained by the limited wars was over. Victory, henceforth, would depend on the domestic strength, and Napoleon had failed to establish a principle of obligation to maintain his conquests, would find his power sapped by the constant need for the application of force. Metternich had in the meantime become an ambassador to Paris, from what he sent a flood of advice, deferential and subtle and respectful and un remitting for the domestic reorganization for the continued military reform for evading Napoleon's suggestions of disarmament and for strengthening the national cohesion. Public opinion, wrote Metternich in 1808, is one of the most powerful weapons which like, religious which, like religion penetrates the most hidden corners where the administrative measures lose their influence. The despised public opinion is like despising moral principles. Public opinion requires a cult, all its own. Posterity will hardly believe that we regard silence as an effective weapon in this, this century of words. And he summed up his goals in an eloquent dispatch written soon after the news of Tilsit in 1807. A day will arrive through the wisdom of our government when 300,000 men will play the first role in a Europe of a universal anarchy. At one of the moments will always follow a great absurdion. Nobody can predict the day to save, that nothing delays except the life of a single individual who has not taken any step to prevent the inevitable chaos. Force might conquer the world, but it cannot legitimize itself. It was Austria's task to preserve her integrity as her repository of all that remain of the old principles and the old forms, and this course of time was bound to bring Austria powerful allies. Napoleon's war in Spain seemed to confirm Menenek's expectations. For the first time, Napoleon was confronted by an enemy which did not surrender after a lost battle and the resources which did not augment those of France. The early reserves of Napoleon's replacement army shattered the myth of its invincibility. We have learned a great secret, Menenek wrote in 1808. Napoleon was was but one army. The Grand Army and the French recruits are no better than the than other nations. He took it for granted that Spain he defeated militarily, but it would be not pacified. Since Napoleon's character will not let him think of withdrawing, Spain would remain a drain on French resources of men and material. Even more important, there was a moral game. Austerwitz has demonstrated that it was risky to Napoleon's enemy, Jena, that it was disastrous to remain neutral. But Spain proved beyond a doubt that it was a fatal to Napoleon's friend. What then were the alternatives? To be oneself, Metternich argued, and not to lose a moment in repairing past losses, that there was no doubt that Napoleon aimed at Austria's destruction for, both by its extents and the principles it represented. It's the existence of and compatible with his universal do domination.
but there was a limit to the exertion that Spain has demonstrated. A resolute opponent, moreover, would now find allies, even within France, and all the individuals satiated by glory and eager to enjoy its rewards undisturbed. Above all, Talleyrand and Fouche, whom Menerick describes as being like sailors so eager to mutiny against a daring pilot, but not until the ship has struck some rocks. Any war outside the natural limits of the Rhine, the Alps, and the Pyrenees was no longer a war of France, but the war of Napoleon. Menerick crowed at Talleyrand as saying, but Menerick did not look allies within France. Once more, he resurrected his plan of the Austro-Russian understanding. He proposed that the Tsar be approached directly with a frank explanation of Austria's determination and difficulties, coupled with a specific proposal of military cooperation. He explained to the Russian minister, Romanov, then in Paris, how unnatural the alliance of Russia and France was and how impossible a durable peace in Europe without a strong century. The homelies on the nature of the equilibrium proved unveiling. However, in 1809, as in 1805 and 1806, Russia stood passively by while the conqueror advanced to its borders. So Austria found itself in 1809 in a war for her survival, a war fought for the last time in Menelik's period in the name of national identity. And by an army based on conscription, even Menelik was swept along by the national enthusiasm so foreign to his cosmopolitan outlook. Napoleon based his hope for his success, he wrote to his chief, Satan, on the slowness of our movements, on the repose which he will take after the first success, or the discouragement and the paralysis which will follow our first defeat. Let us therefore adopt his principles. Let us not consider ourselves victorious until the day after the battle, nor defeated until four days later. Let us always carry the sword in one hand, and the olive branch in another, always ready to negotiate, but negotiating while only while advancing. A man cannot run the same risk as an ancient empire. We are, for the first time, strong in ourselves. Let us act. Let us never forget that the year 1809 is either the end of an old era or a beginning of a new one. But it was what but it was to be neither. There may be a fitness of things in the universe, but it does not operate in a finite time, and certainly not in a brief one. The finest army ever created by Austria was defeated, and the Emperor unwilling to risk everything sued for peace. Never again under Menelik was Austria was attempt to solitary efforts or to stake its faith on the moral dispositions of its people. The war of 1809 was thus neither the end nor the beginning of an era, but rather a turning point and a continuation. It was a turning point for it confirmed an already powerful hesitation of the emperor to build further on the support of the polygot nationalities composing his empires. Henceforth, he will seek security and stability and the least possible change of existing institutions. It was the continuation of a mode of government which had lost its elan and its self-confidence, which knew its limits but hardly its goals, particularly in its domestic matters and which has its risk by the careful involvement of the largest possible numbers of allies. The foundations of the Mennonite system was laid in 1809. This was a year too when Emperor of France asked Mennonite to become his foreign minister, a post he will not relinquish for 39 years. It was symbolic of the lesson that Austria drew from the war, that a man more than any other had urged it now became art the architect of peace who would repair by cunning patience and manipulation what had been lost by total commitment. A state defeated in war and menaced by dissolution has two broad choices, open opposition or persuasion. If it treats the defeat as a reflection of its national resolution but not on its strength, it will tend to make up for its efficiencies on the battlefield by a greater mobilization of its resources and a higher development of its morale until another and more favorable opportunity permits it to try again in a contest in arms.
This was the attitude of Austria after 1805, or may be convinced of his physical impotence, and try to save its natural substance by the adaption to the victor. This is not necessarily a heroic policy, although in certain circumstances it may be heroic at all. To cooperate with losing one soul, to exist without sacrificing one identity, to work for deliverance in the guise of bondage, and under and for science, what's harder the test of moral toughness exists. This is, was in any case, the policy of Austria after 1809 imposed at least in part by its physical impotence. For the peace derived Austria of one third of its territory, the, the, its defensive bastions and its outlet to the sea along the Adriatic coast, the new French province of Ilia foreshadowed her later designs on Hungary while the Duchy of Warsaw to the north represent a mortgage on Austria's goods behavior. And the empire was financially so ruined that Napoleon did not even limit his army, well, well aware that Austria did not possess sufficient resources to maintain a substantial force. After 1805, Menner told the emperor in his first statement of policy, Austria was, was still strong enough to work for general deliverance. It will now be forced to seek its security in its adaption to the French system. I need hardly repeat how little we fit into the system so contrary to our principles of a rightly conceived policy, but never again we can think of a resistance without Russian help. That vacillating court may be awoken more quickly when it can no longer earn an exclusive merit through its miserable policy. Only one escape is left to us to conserve our strength for better days and to work for our preservation with gentle means and not to look back. All the elements of Nenaric policies are united here. The conviction of the incapability of a system of conquest with an organized international community, the trust of Russia, the failure of reliance, and the flexibility of tactics for the achievement of a goal which, because it reflected universal laws, was none the less inevitable for seeming so remote. Menenik was proposing a policy which was today would call collaboration. It is a policy which can only be carried out by a state of a certain, certain of its moral strength or overwhelmed by the consciousness of a moral impotence. It is a policy which places a peculiar strain on the domestic principles of obligation for it can be never legitimized by its real motives. Its success depends on its appearance of sincerity. And on the ability, as Menenik once said, of the seemingly, seemingly the dupe without being it. To show one purpose is to court disaster, to succeed com too completely to invite, is to invite disintegration. In such periods, the knave and the hero, the traitor and the statesman are distinguished not by their acts, but their motives. At what stage will collaboration damage the national substance? At what point it becomes an excuse for an easy way out? These are questions that can be resolved only by the people who have lived through the ordeal and not by abstract speculation. Collaboration can be carried out successfully only by a social organism of great cohesiveness and high morale because it presupposes a degree of confidence in the leadership which makes treason seem inconceivable. The moral straits of Austria, on which Metternich counted to achieve victory in war, fell in this objective. But it saved Austria in a period of, humili of a humiliating peace. This, then, was Menelik policy to keep all the options open, to retain maximal freedom of action, but to limit all the commitments by the need, with, by the need to win French confidence. Austria joined the continental system against England, but it never broke relations with it. Menelik remains close touch with the Hardenberg, the envoy of Hanover. And thus directly, thus indirectly, of the Prince Regent of Great Britain, he went so far to express the hope through Hardenberg that the relations between Austria and Britain would not only remain friendly, but to extend to mutual advice. Correct relations were maintained with Russia, but it remained clear that the French forbearance, not Russian existence, was considered the, considered the basis of Austrian policy. The condition of Austrian survival was a relaxation of French pressure, but pressure would not be relaxed and negotiation would be meaningless without a framework of confidence, and confidence where he supposed a principle to which Napoleon find it possible to agree.
which identified the interests of Austria and France at least to a certain extent. How to reconcile the claims of universal domination with those of equilibrium of a state which every limit was a challenge and of an empire for which limitation was a condition of survival? There was one weak point in the Napoleonic structure, however, which Metternich had never tried to point out that legitimacy depends on the acceptance, not imposition, that for all its conquests, the fate of the French Empire depended on the life of one man. Benedict therefore appeared to a sense of insecurity of the Pernu to the create the only bond which Napoleon would recognize as a claim. He borrowed legitimacy for time, a hope for a permanence, a permanence against a promise of survival. He arranged a marriage of a daughter of Emperor France, the apostate Majadacy, Majadacy, eh. Sorry, I can't talk right now. And the last Holy Emperor, Holy Roman Emperor, who house had ruled for 500 years with Napoleon and the Corson, who have ruled for 10. Whenever Napoleon destroys something, Metternich wrote to the Emperor in 1810, he speaks of guarantees. This expression in its usual sense is hardly compatible with his actions. A guarantee commonly rests on the state of political relationships, but Napoleon does not appreciate the political aspects of the guarantees, but the aims at reality and at certainty. Thus, each exertion becomes for him a guarantee of his strength and of existence. In a sense, he motivates each overthrow of the throne by the semblance of self-defense. In the, in the marriage of your majesty Napoleon, found the guarantee which he sought in vain in overthrow of Austria throne. Thus, Metternich transcends the chasm between opposing legitimacy and what characterize revolutionary situation by boldly using Napoleon concepts of legitimacy, the only one he recognizes against him. As just as Napoleon Congress was due to the fact that his opponents can not conceive a policy of limited objectives, so Napoleon's final overthrow was caused by his inability to comprehend the instability of dynastic relations. Menelik did not wait to take advantage of his new position. He visited Paris in order to help the new empress accommodate herself and divine Napoleon next move. He obtained very few concessions, a slight reduction on Austrian immunity their permission to flow a Rome in Belgium and to mediate between the Pope and Napoleon. But he left with an invaluable conviction that a French attack on Russia was inevitable, that it would be probably occur in the summer of 1812, and that Austria would have a respite for this reason, if no other. Although Austria used its interval to restore its finances, the imminence of a war posed a dilemma. For now, the Russian alliance so long and so desperately saw it seem available for the asking. The continental equilibrium was again within reach. Even Prussia, since Tilsit, reduced to a power of second reign, extended failures for an alliance. But Nedernik was aware that the defeat of 1809 had left the Austrian Empire without any margin for error. He knew that another lost war or even a protracted one will lead to the disintegration and he trusted neither the physical strength of Prussia nor the moral stamina of Russia. On the other hand, Metternich, in a memorandum to the Emperor, an alliance with France was out the question for it undermined the sources of Austrian strength, its claims to moral superiority, and while neutrality would incur the hostility of Russia while obtaining the friendship of France. It would exclude Austria from any voice in the future peace settlement and condemned her to a role of a second-class power. A, sec a series of paradoxes may be intriguing for the philosopher, but they are a nightmare for a statesman. For the latter must not only contemplate, but resolve them. An alliance with Russia might lead to the defeat of Napoleon, but it might also cause the brunt of the war to fall on Austria and end with another Russian betrayal. An alliance with France will undermine Austria's moral position while armed neutrality will exhaust her material resources. Austria had thus reached precisely the point of its collaboration began to pay diminishing returns.
the borderline between passive struggle and loss of will, Metternich attempts to escape the dilemma by, living, by limiting his commitment. While the other powers extended theirs, he hoped to restore Austria a measure of freedom of action while utilizing the crisis to develop her strength. The means he chose was further a step on the road of an adaptation to France, but hedged in the manner which testified to Menerich's inward resolve. An alliance was negotiated with France, providing for an Austrian auxiliary corps of 30,000 men to operate under the direct command of Napoleon and to utilize French supplies. In, the, in return, Napoleon guaranteed the integrity of the Austrian Empire and promised that Austria not only ter territorial compensation in proportion to her exertions, but a memorial and additional and presumably disproportionate territory accretion to symbolize the lasting harmony of France and Austria. Whatever one may think of the morality of this next step, there is no doubt that it achieved Metternich's objectives. Austria could arm, not only without the opposition, but with the encouragement of France, and have been assured that of a voice of peace, settlement, and obtaining a symbolic expression of preferential status in the French system. The territorial accretion was contingent on French victory, in which it would be served as a counterweight to France, and meaningless in the case of French defeat, not without justice. Could Menenich describe the Austrian war ever as neither as a war of conquest nor a defensive war, but a war of conservation? It was alliance. Infinite limite. It now remained to make clear that the limitation of the Austrian commitment, Menenich told Hardenberg that Austria had no alternative, that she will never cease to consider herself the core of the resistance to Napoleon, but he added that the open resistance was foolhardy until Austria was more powerful, and he urged Britain to increase its diversion in Spain. At the same time, he assured Russia that Austria had no aggressive intent, and made the startling proposal that Austria and Russia agree on the conduct of war to preserve the Austrian auxiliary corps and keep it from serious participations in main operations. He suggested that the Russian con country troops in Glacia to justify Austrian in inaction and furbish a pretext for the creation of yet another army corps, but he evaded the Russian request that he reduce these offers to writings. Determined not to risk Austria's existence in the first battle, Menelik strove by the dexterity of his maneuvers to achieve the isolation which an insular location furnished by more favored powers until he had gauged the consolidation of forces that could let Austria play its real and traditional role, the organization of coalition and the legitimization of peace. This then was Menelik's position. When the first news of the French disaster in Russia reached him, the War of 1805 had taught him that tenuousness of an alliance, that of 1809, their necessity. The events of 1805 had convinced him that immediate danger might justify isolation as well as a coalition that continental policy could not be conducted ad hoc. The disaster of 1809 left him to believe that the natural land was no substitute for a material base. Throughout this period, Russia's conduct had been ambiguous. She had helped destroy the powers who could not act as a barrier against France and till her own territories were threatened, had reconciled from the combat after the first defeat. Now as Russian troops swept westward, Menenik feared that success, as much as their irresolution, had not as fought nearly a decade for equilibrium in order to replace the supremacy of the West by a dominance from the East, and he not not nurse Austria back to a monicum of strength to risk in a fit of enthusiasm. When Russia pointed out that the moment for the change of size had arrived, Menik replied that Austria's present position was not his own choosing, that a power whose very existence depended on the recognition on the sanctity of treaties relations could not simply break an alliance, and that Austrian policy was not based on sentiment but on cold calculation. The moment that indeed arrived when, as Metternich 
Medinek predicted, 300,000 men could play the first role in, in a Europe of universal anarchy. But Austria barely one-fifth that, one that number and half of them were in Russia with Napoleon. Even more important, Austria had to test not only the Russian resolution but the kind of war it would rage. For Austria, it was interested not in the freedom of nations but in the liberty of historical states. A people war might involve the dissolution of the polygot empire and national crusade might lead to the overthrow of dynasties on which the austria germans position was based how hard is it fall of a great man exclaimed Menenik. all the plans of the poor central power must be directed towards not be ground to powder everything depended therefore not only on the defeat of napoleon but on the manner in which it was achieved not only on the creation of a coalition but also on the principle in which the name of which it was to the fight it was a great state it forced in a, to act in a situation of great peril menenik said during the crimean war in a situation which he never ceased to consider ang anguous to 1813 it must at least secure itself a position of supreme leadership this was all more important for the great central europe situated in the middle of contending states whose rear was protected by the sea or by the steppes before austria enters a war it must be secure not only its military but its moral position but it's clear that austria moral position require a war of states not of nations a coalition legitimized by a doctrine of conservatism and stability and brought about if possible in the name of the existing treaties rather than by their rupture in addition in addition the consideration of powers inspired Menenik with caution for napoleon although defeated in russia was still a master of the low countries of italy and illyria the secondary german powers of the confederation of the rhine was still his satellites prussia his ally and Menenik was confirmed in his deliberate policy by his conviction that the time had come to put his familiarity with Napoleon's character to good use. Napoleon and I spent use together, he wrote in 1820. As if the game of chess carefully watching each other, I to check him, checkmate him, he to crush me together with the chess figures. This was a symbolization of the issue of the period. The man of will and the man of reason the principle of universality and the sense of limit, the assertion of power and the claim of legitimacy. But wherever else, the events of 1812 have proved that they had demonstrated that the game could no longer be won by pulverizing the other. The antagonist or the pieces that had to be played according to his own rules, which placed a premium on subtlety and not on brute strength. The longer Napoleon hesitated in recognizing this truth, the more certain his ultimate defeat. Universal claims, if backed by a substantial force or opposed by insufficient resolution, can, through their very enormity, disintegrate the structure of in international relations. But when the means are limited and the antagonist determined, the memory of great success may cause illusion which prelude to disaster. The kind of game Mendenik decided to play was moreover not one bold maneuver which risked everything on a correct checkmate. Rather it was deliberate and cunning, a game where the advantage lay in gradual transformation of the position in which the opponent moves were utilized and first to paralyze and to destroy him while the master marshaled his resources. It was a game whose daring resided in the loneliness which had to be played in the face of non comprehension and abuse by friend and foe whose courage lay in an imperability when one wrong move might mean disaster and the loss of confidence that might spell isolation whose greatness derived from the skill of its moves and not from the inspiration of its conception it was a game at the end at which austria had attained supreme command of the alliance had deflected the war from its territory had based the coalition on the cabinets and on the people and thereby had assured a peace that legitimization of which was consistent with her continued existence it was not heroic but it saved an empire menenik opening gambit 
was a dispatch to the Austrian charged affairs at the French headquarters in Vienna and set on 9th of December, which was known that Napoleon had failed, but not how seriously he had been defeated. Subtle and sarcastic at the same time, conciliatory and threatening, it set the tone of the sequent events and determined the kind of game this was to be. It was significant, resided less in its content, which only the first step in an intricate maneuver, the full implication of which would not become apparent for seven months than its tone and the exertion of the independence which a men are considered equivalent of the health of the individual. It began with an ironical summary of the existing situation. Austria has spent too much respect to permit itself an opinion about military dispositions of the greatest commander of the century. It was a novel problem. The cabinet St. Petersburg had given so many proof of its inconstancy that even my that even that the sorbrous calculation permitted the assumption that an enterprise so much against all the probability as the conquest of Moscow would be induced Alexander to negotiate, but this hope had been disappointed. Russia had found it so easy to surrender the interests of its allies, it cannot be induced to surrender its own. The paragraph was a plenary. Uh, to a long analysis of the military and psychological possibilities which resolve itself in the proposition that all victories of the Grand Army had achieved nothing, that the conquest of Russia was impossible, the motive for a separate peace non-existent. What then was the solution? Austria's good offices, Menelik replied, for the negotiation of a general peace. Only Austria, he maintained, could approach the other nations without offending the dignity while united to France by the bonds of family, the state which kept 50 million people in the century of Europe in check had a duty to speak of the peace towards France if only maintain appearances. The threatening affirmation of Austria's good faith was followed by another ambiguity. The Emperor of the French seems to, be, seems to have foreseen what is happening today when he told me so frequently that the marriage to to Maria Louise, had transformed the face of Europe. The moment is near. It may have already arrived when Napoleon will draw the real advantage from this unfortunate alliance. Menonite concluded with a phrase he not only underlined but stressed of the subtle obtuseness and devious daring. When our exalted master learned of the evacuation of Moscow, he summed up the essence of this attitude in a few words. The moment I has, co I has come when I can show the Emperor of French who I am, I will confine myself to repeating these words of his majesty, so simple at the same time, so energetic, and I empower you to communicate them to the Duke of Bassanel, the French foreign minister. Any commentary will be detract from their force, and thus Menerick opened the campaign which was led to the coalition against Napoleon by offering him an antagonist peace. In this manner, he took the first step in obtaining France approval for a transformation for transforming the alliance to neutrality, the neutrality to mediation, and mediation to war, all accomplished in the name of the existing treaties initially motivated by the concern for the great ally. It may be asked why Menenik had chosen a procedure so indirect, a method so intricate and so difficult to legitimize. Why not attempt to adopt the Austrian domestic structure to the naturally sweeping across Europe, but a statesman must work with the material at hand and the domestic structure of Austria was so rigid, much more rigid paradoxically than the international one, but before we examine the impact of the Austrian domestic structure on Menelik's foreign policy, we must turn to another statesman, the foreign minister of the power which had fought Napoleon most persistently. He too attempted to animate a coalition and he too appeared on the scene by advancing a plan for peace.